could imagine my career has been a series of jumps from one thing into another, but actually there is a common thread linking them all together. And it started when I was a little boy growing up in Melbourne, in southern Australia. And um, Port Phillip Bay is, is the, the water body that the city's on. And it was a wonderful natural playground. And I discovered at the age of about eight or nine that there were fossils in the bay that were the bones of whales and, and fish and so forth that had lived six million years ago in an ancient bay that had long since vanished. And so it was wonderful to be diving in the bay with my snorkel and flippers, finding these remains of the ancient bay. And it somehow fired my imagination to become a paleontologist. And so for a while I, I studied paleontology and then practiced as a uh, professional and then became interested in modern mammals and did that for a while. That grew out of my paleontological interests. When I was in my late 20s, I discovered the island of New Guinea and it's an extraordinary place with amazing biodiversity. I initially went there really because of my interest in paleontology. In some ways the New Guinean rainforests represent an ancient living relic of environments that prospered in Australia four or five million years ago. But as I went there to study, I realised that the modern fauna of New Guinea was very poorly documented. And the very first mountaintop that I went to, uh, we discovered a gigantic rat, nearly a metre long, and a wallaby, which was you know, a medium-sized animal, both of which were unknown to science. And so that fired my imagination. It's a very difficult environment to work in. Um, malaria is a major problem. Um, I, I've had arrows pointed at me in anger from tribal people. Um, it, it can be really tough at times, but the rewards are simply enormous. And I suppose the high point of my whole career in New Guinea was in 1994 when uh, we discovered a kind of tree kangaroo which uh, lived on the highest mountains in the island of New Guinea. It lived above the tree line, this creature, so it's in the alpine herb fields and so forth, so it's a tree kangaroo that doesn't live in trees, an even more enigmatic sort of thing. Um, and it would stand about that high. It's probably the size of a, a Labrador, that sort of sized animal, but looks like a small panda. Black and white, very dense fur, uh, very tame because it lives in a habitat where there's very few people. And to think that that most extraordinary kangaroo had survived until almost the end of the 20th century before it had been discovered by science was a humbling experience, a wonderful experience. Some tree kangaroos are considered sacred the beliefs varied from place to place across the island, but in the case of Dingiso, that large black and white animal, that is considered sacred by the uh, Moni people up in that area. And they say that when they come across the animal, it raises its hands in the air like that and whistles. It goes, like that sort of noise. And they say that's a recognition of kinship and that it is saying, I'm your ancestor, and, and they very much respect that. They say that even their hunting dogs creep past on the ground because they don't want to disturb the, the very august ancestor animal. Um, but, you know, as a biologist, I know that tree kangaroos do that when they meet another tree kangaroo, particularly males. they they protecting their territory, and, you know, if you don't move on, you get scratched. And the whistle, presumably, is a similar sort of a thing, a territorial marker. <laughs> Working with the people of Papua New Guinea has been one of the greatest privileges of my life because uh, I'm, I'm a biologist, I'm interested in nature, and when you go into a village with those people and they start talking to you about nature, you realise what you're getting is not just that man's life experience of a particular species, but his father's experience and his grandfather's experience, way, way back, being built on because the stories are told over and over again. And the, the best of the hunters in New Guinea are like walking encyclopedias of knowledge about natural systems. Now, of course, their culture is different and the way things are expressed is different and it often takes time to work your way through that. And sometimes it's very challenging living in those villages because they're very different from a Western lifestyle. But nevertheless, um, it was one of the great privileges ever to, to sit at the feet of those professors, really, and learn what they knew. You know, I should have understood the threat that climate change represents earlier than I did, because when I was working in New Guinea through the 1980s and 90s, every mountain summit I climbed, I saw evidence of the tree line advancing. So there was a, as good a fingerprint as you could ever want to see of the warming of the planet, you know, because the tree line's held where it is by climatic constraint. Um, but it was only really when I finished my field work, and I'd been at Harvard for a year, came back to Australia um, and was asked to advise a state government on 
scientific issues that I sat back and read the periodicals, scientific periodicals for the last few years and realised that I had missed just what a major threat this climate issue was. And it was at that moment I realised everything that I held precious, all of the biodiversity, the, 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 even perhaps the security of our civilization, was under threat by this problem. It was then I decided to write a book about the problem and wrote The Weathermakers. And since then, I've, that's been my life, I guess. I've been involved with uh, the climate issue uh, ever since.